welcome to today's Career Day panel, all about artistic planning and operations, otherwise known as how the magic happens. <laughs> um, and I'm just so excited for this fourth of four uh, series in the uh, in the in this series of Career Day panels. If you haven't seen some of the first ones, we talked about development and marketing and communications. How do we build these relationships with our patrons and donors? Uh, to you know, really get them connected to what we're doing with our organizations. And then we talked with our education, community engagement and youth orchestra team members and uh, how they help spread the word of uh, music education in their communities, how they are advocates for and how they just get the communities able to participate in the art and um, build build stronger relationships that way. So, so excited for today. It's the uh, fourth of four and of course, this is my <laughs> my uh, place of expertise. My first love is the world of operations, and the people I get to work with most are our artistic friends. So, um, lots of good representation here. So, we are going to dive in and start off with some introductions. Um, so, I guess I'll go first, and then we'll tip to our operations team and then our artistic team. Team. So, I'm Sonia Thomes. I'm VP of Operations at the Nashville Symphony. Symphony. And I also was hoping everyone would else share what inspired, what's maybe one of the best parts about your job. And for me, it's always been seeing it all come together and seeing that, that audience just have a phenomenal time and connect with the music. And that is all I need to uh, boost my health meter. And of course, in the last year, that's been what we've all been missing. So can't wait for it to come back. Hi, my name's Eric Shen. Um, I am, uh, I recently uh, joined the Kalamazoo Symphony about two months ago as their new director of operations. I was previously with the York uh, Symphony Orchestra in South Central Pennsylvania. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, with my new job, the thing that I love is how varied it is from day to day, uh, never doing the same thing twice. Everything is always new and different. Uh, John Roloff with the uh, Milwaukee Symphony, um, previously with the Des Moines Symphony, uh, but been here for almost six years now. Um, operations and facilities, uh, kind of my whole life here in the orchestra world. Um, I uh, often tell a cliche story, well, I shouldn't say cliche, but um, in my old job, we, I got to do a concert for 100,000 people on the 4th of July. And it was basically a, a 72 hour marathon to set everything up on the state capitol grounds and do everything. And it's, uh, it was always really rewarding when we got to the climactic finale of the 1812 every year to uh, cue the cannons and uh, over the radio cue the fireworks. Um, and I think that's just uh, a really exact way of saying kind of what Sonia said, seeing it all come together and just knowing that uh, you played a part in bringing happiness to so many people. My name is Terrell Pierce. I'm the operations manager uh, with Milwaukee Symphony. I'm on John's team. Um, I was previously in Chicago with the Chicago Philharmonic for about seven, seven and a half years. And I just, thinking about operations, I love the way such a unique team and such a unique group of different skill sets, you know, we all pull together and, and reach across even to artistic and, and other things from, you know, facilities, schedule, whatever, whatever challenges you have. Um, and then it, it comes together for whatever performance, whatever project, whatever event uh, you're working on. So I, I like the, I like the blend, how, how Eric mentioned so many different skills coming uh, it's doing so many different things every day. You, you see so many different people doing different things to, to execute one. Thing. Everyone, I'm, I'm Jessica Slice. I'm the VP of Artistic Administration also at the National Symphony where I work with Sonia and Enrico. Um, and I've been here about four years and I came from the Omaha Symphony where I was in a similar role, but I also spent a good portion of my early career in the music library, which I'll touch on a little bit later and how all that <laughs> ties together. Um, and of course, in addition to seeing everything come together, the other 
my other favorite part of my job is certainly the beginning of that process and the collaborations I get to do um, creatively with our conductors, with guest artists, and really how that develops over time and we get to revisit new ideas and build on what we've done before. Hi, my name is Enrico Lopez Yanez. I'm the principal pops conductor of the Nashville Symphony, where I work with Sonia and Jess. Uh, I'd say that one of the things, I mean, Conductor is a slightly different version of artistic maybe than the planning portion, though I work very closely with all the uh, folks on this Zoom call. Uh, but I'd say that for the symphonic world in particular, one thing I love about just being in this industry is the variety of opportunities we have to use different interests and skills that we have from every stage of our life. Um, working at a symphony orchestra, we collaborate with you know, hip hop artists one day, then a jazz band the next day, then we're doing a Harry Potter movie on stage. And then we're going out into the community and doing a Hispanic Heritage Month concert. And I mean, just the variety of music and collaborations with community partners and local, you know, ensembles, and then working with little kids and inspiring them. It's just such a magical world of variety, but also just great music and great opportunities to meet and work with all kinds of different people. Thank you. Yeah, no two days are the same in the world of concert production, which has kept me interested for over 15 years. And, um, you know, I have a lot less steps on my pedometer these days, but I can't wait until I am just schlepping all over backstage and up and down from my office and back down to the stage um, soon, very, very soon. So we're going to dive into just a couple questions and then we will open it up to you all for your questions to the panelists. So um, first, one of the things I love to do with these career day panels is help to just give a little bit of background of each of the panelists, because I think it's so important that we realize there's no no one way to get to work with an orchestra and every way, every path is different. And also um, you might just connect with the part of someone's path that as you hear and realize, oh, I, I'm close to that path, I can do this. So the way we're gonna do that is, Enrico, I'm just gonna come back to you um, and we'll go back around. And so if you can just talk a little bit about what did you study in school? And then what were some of the key turning points that led you to uh, your current role? Sure. Uh, so I did my undergrad and master's in trumpet performance were my main focal points. Uh, and it wasn't until the end of my undergrad degree that I decided, you know, I think what I want to do is be a conductor. And I had sort of taken the conducting classes in school and had an interest in it growing up, but hadn't really pursued it until that time. Uh, so my teacher, one of the turning points was he said, you know, why don't you stay on at school, get your master's in trumpet on paper, but really pursue conducting. So I started doing summer festivals for conducting, uh, went on then to study conducting at the University of Maryland, uh, where when I got there, I said, you know, I want to be an opera conductor. That's what I want to do when I grow up. Um, and the next turning point in my life was that I took an audition during the last year of my master's at the Omaha Symphony, where actually Jess was working. And I won my first professional job as a symphonic conductor. I got the conducting fellow position, which turned into an assistant conductorship with the Omaha Symphony and sort of started diving into the symphonic world, which I hadn't really been exposed to outside of just playing a new youth symphony growing up. Uh, and learning that repertoire really got me excited about the world of symphonic music. And again, those types of collaborations of getting to do pops concerts, family concerts, and other things. Uh, I eventually moved on to be the assistant conductor at the Nashville Symphony. And that was probably the next major turning point was being in Nashville and working with these huge major, you know, pop stars and traveling artists and just being like, okay, this is really cool. I could see myself doing this forever. And uh, when I was offered the position of principal pops, I took it up because it was, you know, the opportunity to work with rock bands, work with DJs, work with all these kinds of groups that I had participated in as a high school and middle school student was playing drums in a rock band or, you know, playing mariachi uh, gigs down in Mexico on weekends and, you know, things like that, where I was like, okay, this, this is the culmination of all the things I've been doing in my life. And now I get to do it as a career. So that was really a special moment. So I studied clarinet performance and I'm really enjoying Meredith's picture today because of that. Um, although I, I, similar to what Enrico was saying, I knew I wasn't going to become 
a professional clarinetist. Um, it let me kind of explore whatever I wanted in the music department. Um, and the, the biggest thing was then discovering the music library and what was happening there and bringing together my, you know, uh, a type organizational detail oriented <laughs> side of my life into a really good lane in music. Um, and I had just enough understanding of that career to realize what the major orchestra librarians association was and where their job postings were. Um, and I would say, you know, the biggest early thing for me that brings me to today was um, becoming the library fellow at the New World Symphony right out of college um, and doing my apprenticeship there and learning that career and then getting getting into a job because that isn't something anybody grows up saying they want to do or even knowing what it is. Um, but on behalf of the librarians, get to know them and find out what's going on because they're all amazing people. Um, so, so that was actually so far has been a bigger part of my my career with orchestras so far uh, versus being the artistic administrator, um, but it sort of morphed into that over over thirteen seasons with the Omaha Symphony, um, and my role just kind of kept kept growing, which was obviously key as well as being being ever more entrusted with our planning and eventually shifting gears there to become um, director of our artistic planning, which then led me to my to my Nashville job. Um, but I think what's really important about how that <laughs> maybe bridges together was going into the administrative role with the knowledge I had both of the orchestra and how it functions and especially the repertoire and the kinds of things we could do. Um, that is where I felt like confident and excited about moving into this new position was I had that depth and breadth of knowledge, which you need both of those things. Um, and you know that's 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 what's really fun and it's been a great shift for me um well i um also went to undergrad for music i actually um went to a small liberal arts college in iowa and they were dumb enough to uh, let me focus on conducting as an undergrad um but outside of that i um studied privately with the music director of the des moines symphony um, and basically became a conducting fellow for them uh and as a sophomore in college, got to conduct pieces uh, while the conductor wanted to go hear uh, things from the hall. So, uh, you know, never, never give a sophomore, a 19 year old, the ability to conduct Pines of Rome and Mahler too. You're, you're not going to suck them away from the orchestra the rest of their life. But um, at, as I was wrapping up my undergrad, a couple different experiences happened. One, I did a, my senior recital, which was in conducting. Um, but um, my college didn't have a robust orchestra program that I wanted to work with. So I decided I was gonna hire one, which meant I had to go out and write grants and write program notes and be the librarian and kind of do my own little um, orchestra administration, um, little, uh, I guess, project. And uh, didn't realize that's what it was. It was all the end goal of just uh, getting some conducting tapes to go to grad school. Uh, but then simultaneous to that, the gentleman I was studying with said, you should really do an internship um, so that if you ever get a music director job, you kind of understand uh, how to work with the staff, how to work with the board. So I did that. And uh, the internship turned into a job offer, which I thought was going to be one year just before I was truly ready to go to grad school and still hang out with an orchestra. And uh, that spring, I didn't apply to grad school for conducting. I applied to grad school for business because no offense, Enrico, uh, I figured out the world needed more managers than it needed conductors. So here I am. Right. I originally went to college uh, with the mindset that I needed to major in business and minor in music. I'd, I'd been a lifelong musician and I didn't want to let that go, but I thought I, I need to make sure I have a job in line and I can always pursue and enjoy and be a part of music. The, the music department, my advisor, um, kind of discovered that and actually created um, an arts administration program and, and a degree under the, the music department. Uh, and I was a guinea pig. I was the first <laughs> student uh, in, in the program. So I did arts administration. And I also uh, ended up adding uh, tuba performance. Uh, again, I was involved and I, I want to recital competition. So I added tuba performance, which was kind of unexpected. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but then I started working for the, the School of Music as an events coordinator assistant, you know, setting up for rehearsals and recitals, and then ended up 
kind of managing the front of house, whoever was was working, selling tickets and, and ushers and those types of things. And I, I really started to like it. So I started asking questions, learned a little bit more about arts administration and really thought, no, this is definitely kind of the direction I want to go in. And, uh, but I didn't have connections in the field. It was a new program. Um, and so I was trying to rely on other lessons, teachers and, and faculty for connections. And one day the Chicago Philharmonic was rehearsing at renting the space to rehearse. And my boss from the school did probably the most important thing for my career. She went up to the executive director, Donna Milanovic of Chicago Phil and said, hey, I have this great student. He's working as an events coordinator. Can you give him, uh, if you have any opportunities, give him one. And she offered me to work the next day for their performance front of house selling tickets or, or something. And it was the day of my senior tuba recital, of course. And I took it anyways after my recital about an hour afterwards. And that turned into you know a short summer internship, which turned into uh, my career. I started as a uh, personnel coordinator and became personnel manager, director of operations and uh, the director of artistic op operations. Um, but then the opportunity with the Milwaukee Symphony came up and that was a, a chance to work with, you know, a major organization that was really at such a great inflection point, new music director, uh, new hall, so many positive things and ways to um, impact the community. So I thought this was a, that was a good time to, you know, take that chance. And I've been with them a year and a half now. Yeah, uh, it's great to know there are so many brass players here. I'm a trombonist and uh, studied music education and trombone performance in, uh, in, in my undergrad and grad school. Um, thought I was going to go, well, I did go the higher ed route uh, for, for a while. I uh, got a, a doctorate at Florida State and uh, went into college teaching at the University of Florida. Uh, was their adjunct trombone professor for a few years. And um, that position ended, and that was probably one of the first big crossroad points of sort of having to make the decision of, okay, do I want to continue the higher ed side or do I want to try something else? Um, during the summers, I had been working uh, seasonally at some music festivals and uh, gaining some uh, experience on the administrative side of things uh, through that. And I think, I forget who said it, if it was John or somebody um, sort of mentioning the uh, sort of artistic administration world, um, you know, having a little bit more of a need uh, for some, you know, people with music backgrounds. And uh, my undergrad trombone professor uh, kind of nudged me in that route as well. Hey, why don't you kind of take a look at this administrative side of things um, and uh, did and uh, decided to go that way. Uh, after UF and, and uh, was a personnel and operations manager for the York uh, Symphony Orchestra in uh, South Central Pennsylvania. And then, uh, like I mentioned just recently, became the new director of ops of the Kalamazoo Symphony. Excellent. Um, okay, so we're gonna dive a little bit into the work and how this partnership between artistic and operations really does work. So Jess and Enrico, I wanna start with you. Um, so what, describe a little bit about the things you, you have to work on in your role. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Jess. And um, what are the things you have to consider? What are the areas that you're working on and who do you collaborate with most? Just give us a little bit of taste of what your life is like. <laughs> sure. Well, yes, definitely um, some of my closest collaborators are our staff conductors, which includes Enrico and our principal pops conductor role and Giancarlo Guerrero, our, our music director. Um, as we're, you know, coming up with how we're going to shape the, the coming months and years, really, it's always a, a long-term process um, and where we want to take the orchestra artistically. But there's also an ongoing conversation as we're thinking about those things with Sonia and operations and, and the stage manager and finance and all of these other considerations that go into, um, you know, building and agreeing on these artistic goals because um, you have to have 
there are still always parameters. So we, we dream big, but then one has to make it happen. And there are things that, um, you know, from a production standpoint, or even from the, the library and personnel standpoint need to be understood from the beginning, because it's going to get you down a path and into a situation that you're committing to and you're committing to your audience for. Um, and we need to understand um, the whole the whole picture. Um, but I also certainly have a lot of relationships that I maintain externally with managers and agents that represent our guest artists and with guest artists and other guest conductors um, directly as well, which is a really fun part of the job too, because you're you're building that up over time and get to work with them specifically on new ideas and building on, on what you've done. So um, there's sort of a there's, there's sort of a point of contact here through my role to all of those people as well. Thanks, Jess. Um, Enrico, I'm going to come back to you, but I want to hear from our ops folks. So uh, John or Eric or Terrell, jump in if you'd like. Um, at what point are you brought into the process? Okay, because I feel like we're all, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> brought in at different points, um, but there's a lot of long-term planning that happens. Obviously, there's short-term planning and short-term needs. Well, where do you feel like your process starts in your work of operations? I think, you know, that that um, can vary widely depending on um, what exactly you're looking at. Um, there are certain things um, where you're you're meeting with artistic planning, um, you know, two, three years out and, and talking about maybe some big projects that um, could have implications on the operations side. And, you know, can we even do this? which usually those conversations are never fun, um, but we always find a way. Um, and then um, once on my end, the season really starts to crystallize. I am um, kind of the master schedule keeper, uh, at least for the MSO and um, the keeper of the faith when it comes to the CBA and all of the scheduling rules. And so when we get to the point that um, the repertoire is set enough that we kind of know, is this a double, is this a triple? How is this all gonna shake out? Um, I get the calendar and it's what, it's like Christmas to me. I get to um, play chess for about uh, three or four hours and figure out how all the other pieces are gonna fall in. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's just very, very exciting. Uh, and then of course, um, from that point on, we kind of lock things in and um, then, are basically to the budgeting standpoint and, and uh, then collaborate with the artistic team to uh, make sure that what we're interpreting as their vision um, is executed uh, in the most financially responsible way. Yeah, and so then I'm, I imagine you pass it off to Terrell and Terrell, you, you get to take it from a certain point then all the way to execution, is that is that correct? Right. Uh, I'm focusing more on the day-to-day -day operations. So once the, the master plan is in place, then it's uh, down to the logistics of production planning. And uh, right now, especially in, in COVID world, so many unique things with, with stage management and COVID uh, protocols and all of these things, testing all, all of those, all that side of things. So um, yeah, it's getting down to the real execution of those those master plans after, as they've kind of taken shape. And who are some of the people you collaborate most with uh, in that execution phase? Right. Well, of, of course, John, uh, <laughs> but uh, it branches to principal librarian, uh, director of, of personnel, stage management, production manager. Right now, we are heavily relying on, you know, our video and audio team with all of the virtual performances and things, but of course, throughout the season, making sure uh, we're on the same page. Um, music director, you know, we, we kind of branch across and especially in operations too, with, with special events, dealing with facilities director, um, event planning, event manager for uh, rentals and all sorts of things. So uh, yeah, you really uh, span pretty far and, and occasionally um, working out uh, contract logistics if needed for, for contract writers with guest artists and, and, and touring companies and those types of things. Right now, you know, we're looking a lot at the 21-22 season. I'm sure like a lot of orchestras are, um, you know, I think like John said, normally you're trying to work like two to three years out and with COVID that's just 
you know, for us here in Kalamazoo, that's, that's not really happening. You know, everybody's kind of had to uh, learn how to flip things around a lot quicker. Um, and so, you know, the, our executive director and music director will kind of put a season uh, together. Um, you know, the music director is going to pick repertoire that they want, and they're going to pick some guest artists that they want. Um, you know, the, and the new executive director will sort of balance that out with, you know, what uh, guests can we afford and what venues are we looking to play in? Uh, what parts of the city are we looking to kind of reach out to and things like that? Um, and then, yeah, then at that point, it gets kind of turned over to me. You know, can we play this program in this hall with the current social distancing guidelines? Or, you know, can we, you know, you know, all, all, all the fun, you know, COVID things and, um, you know, and then it's, it's my job to sort of reach out to my team uh, here in Kalamazoo. We do have a, a, I have an assistant director, I have a librarian, and I have a stage manager. And so um, one of the big transition elements to me for this new job is instead of being sort of a, a one person operations department, you know, now I have a team and sort of delegating those responsibilities out to my team members um, and not uh, kind of having to work on such a granular uh, level, but kind of stay big picture. Thanks. And Eric, can you touch a little bit on what it was like in your personnel management work? What was that work like? And and um, how how long were you doing that? You were at York when you were doing that. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that was. So the, the personnel stuff was great. I think as a musician, you know, working with other musicians was something that I really enjoyed. And so, you know, I was the person who you know, would write up the contracts uh, for our contract musicians and, you know, make sure everything was sort of taken care of for them. And then, you know, filling in the holes on each concert uh, with our substitute players, um, running all the auditions, you know, of course with COVID, not a lot of orchestras are having auditions right now, but, you know, when audition season is in full swing, you're sort of taking care of all that, planning auditions, uh, making sure that that audition experience is really great for the candidates who who come in uh, to play for you. Um, keeping the sub list rosters up to date. I mean, people are always moving all over the country. Um, and so, you know, knowing who the players are, um, you know, who are you going to be your your great principal players or assistant principal players, then who might be better. And, uh, uh, you know, when you talk about pops, for instance, you know, for pops concerts, a lot of times you're asking for specific skill sets. You might need people who have specific doubling capabilities. You might need people with uh, jazz improvisation um, abilities. And so making sure that you're kind of keeping track of, of all those skill sets uh, from a personnel standpoint. Great, thank you. So Enrico, uh, I, I saved you for the last one because you are at the beginning of, this, of the whole arc and then everything for us and on off staff, I would say I, I get to take a break once the tuning A happens and you step out on stage. So, I mean, what is it like for you to see that whole process um, come full circle? Well, first I'll say you don't always get to take it easy after the tuning A. There are all kinds of problems that can happen during the rehearsal period or during the concert that involve operations. And then Sonia's running down the hall saving the day. But generally speaking, yes, we like that to be the uh, goal. Um, I mean, it's great I, getting to start off working with Jess, you know, a year or two in advance to say, okay, let's create this arc to our season and who's our target audience? Where are we trying to create product to bring in new audiences? And what kind of new markets of people are we trying to reach? And what kind of new product that doesn't already exist out in the marketplace are we trying to create here in Nashville that makes us unique, uh, that can then go and have its own life in other orchestras and other cities? Uh, it's kind of like, you know, you, you have a little child and it's growing up over time and eventually it passes through all the hands of the symphony as we, you know, gather the guest artists and production works on creating, whether it's things from lights to, you know, the ridiculous instrumentations that may come up or weird seatings or other things. And then suddenly you have this product at the end and you get, you know, the audience filling in the hall and you're like, wow, we started this thing a year and a half or two years ago and look, it, it grew into this amazing experience for our city. Um, it, it's really rewarding. And, and I'd say that it's, it's great to be able to collaborate with so many people because, you know, as a conductor, 
we're the, we make no music whatsoever. I mean, we're just waving our hands up there and none of it would be possible if it were not for everyone on the administration and all the musicians on the stage. So yeah, we can dream up these amazing concerts in our brain, but it's up to people like Jess, Eric, John Terrell to create and make happen all of these, you know, ridiculous ideas that we uh, work to, to plan and create together. So it's really fun. Um, Okay, so the last question I have, and anyone can jump in, is you know what skills have you needed to develop most in your work? Uh, because I think that all of us probably would say we did not learn everything we needed to know in school. <laughs> and so I know for me, um, really diving deep into thorough thinking about project timelines and um, decision making and you know, just really cultivating this ability to think through a project from beginning to end and then see all the landmarks and fill in the details and kind of turn over every rock to figure out every problem that I have to solve so that when Enrico steps out on stage, we've done everything we can. And, um, you know, but I think that that has been something I've had to exercise over and over and over again and just understand if I make this decision, then this will happen and this might happen over here. Um, so that's really something that I've had to um, learn a lot. And also, but the hardest part about all of that is I can't do everything myself. So I have to learn how to work with people <laughs> and help, you know, um, lead or follow or influence or um, gain consensus. I mean, the, the working, getting everything done that needs to get done through people is just about the hardest thing in the world, but it's also really exciting. So, um, okay, so now that we're all warmed up, what are some skills that you've had to learn maybe on the job but develop really thoroughly in your work? Anyone for the panel? I'll jump in. Uh, so when John, when Sonia, when you asked John, you know, what, at what point are you invited into the process? I kind of wanted to say it's never too soon, <laughs> probably from your perspective. Okay. Yeah. So this leads to, you know, and this is a pretty broad one for any type of job is, um, you know, really the communication skills, because like much like Sonia, you know, I, I really want to have as much information and detail and research and preparation right for everybody. Um, but also keeping in mind sharing that as soon as possible and to whom it all needs to be shared because it's probably more people than than you might think at first and how that filters down within the organization is really key because, you know, in the artistic role, we're not doing anything until we say like, this is what we're doing. I mean, everybody is waiting us on us in a way to know what's happening, whether that's the marketing department or operations. I mean, everybody Sonia has had these sessions with, um, you know, what we build our, our institutional role around comes from what artistic product we're putting out. So um, really, uh, trying to be uh, as timely and thorough as possible and comprehensive and who you reach. And then the other thing I would say about my particular role that I've really worked on, especially here with the, bare, the diverse number of uh, presentations, excuse me, and of orchestral things that we do is working on uh, negotiation skills. And I mean, specifically negotiating um, things with artists and understanding kind of that dance and understanding everything you need to know about where you are financially and what room you have um, and bringing that back to the relationships you've built with those agents and artists to, to get it done, but get it done within your parameters as, as best as you can. I'll jump in and echo the communication standpoint. Um, this is something and, and kind of working, working with others. This is something that um, I learned a lot at York, but it's even amplified uh, to another degree here in, in, in this orchestra in Kalamazoo. Um, you know, working as sort of a one person operations department, you're kind of able to make all of those decisions internally, you know, uh, m myself. Um, uh, but when you're starting to have to work with people outside the organization, you know, communicating what your vision is to them becomes really important. Um, I was really good from a personnel standpoint with sending a lot of information, a lot of detail or orient, uh, oriented information at once. You know, musicians, if you're gonna hire a musician for something, they wanna know, 
the date, the time, the repertoire, the dress, the compensation, you know, they want to know everything up front. Well, there are other people, especially outside of the orchestra world, where if you would send them, you know, that long of an email, they're just going to kind of freeze up and not, you know, a lot of times you won't even get a response. And so learning how to sort of break the ice a little bit and know what method of communication is going to get you the best end result with what, with each person. Um, in particular, I'm thinking a lot of communications with people in public school districts, you know, whether that's through an education department or, you know, right now here in Kalamazoo, a lot of our venues are shut down for COVID. And so we're reaching out to different, you know, potential places to rehearse and record and things like that. So trying to make inroads with some of these places. And so, you know, sometimes you have to go really slow to get the result that you want. You have to say, hey, can I, uh, I'd love to talk to you. Can I just schedule a phone call? You know, just like a one, two sentence email. And then you might have to have that phone call to explain a little bit more. And then you might have to have a longer email to follow that up. So just knowing that it might take three or four steps, you know, to get to that result that you really want. Oh, one thing I've always tried to do is know as much as possible about everyone's job and what it means to do their job. Uh, when I was in grad school, I interned for the for NLI, the National Orchestral Institute, and I had to book facilities. I had to run the auditions. I did, you know, personnel management for local community orchestras in DC. So I had to set up chairs. I had to fill in absent seats with musicians and call people. Once I got to Omaha, I was asking to sit in any board meeting I could get into. I asked to sit on all the planning meetings just so I could start to get a sense of what is marketing dealing with? What does it mean to be a personnel manager? What is it so that when you down the line have to ask those people to do something for your program, you have some sort of expectation of what it means to actually have to do that work. And if I tell the library and I say, hey, I need cuts in this piece, I've had to do that work before and I know how much time it takes to actually go through 80 musicians books and put in cuts or put in tabs and things like that. So I'm not just awaiting this instant turnaround and being like, what's taking so long? I mean, come on, I asked you to do a 10 measure cut. How big of a deal could that be? It takes a lot of work. Uh, so being able to be sympathetic with other people's work on your team, I think is really helpful to then uh, do a good job and then collaborating with those people down the line. So the first one I would say um, is really straightforward and simple, um, but it is your best friend and it's learn to use Excel. They don't tell you that in music school, but uh, oh, if you can master Excel, you will have the world handed to you on a silver platter. I think this ties into the communication piece, um, but we work in a field steeped in traditions, obviously. Um, so I think the most relevant thing I could say to communication is learning how to ask why in a way that isn't interpreted as you're doing this wrong or why do, you know, why do I have to do that? Uh, I think oftentimes we, we end up in silos, especially operations um, from the rest of the staff. I think we're unique that way. Sometimes we're in a totally different building than everybody else, but more often than not, our, our workspaces are shoehorned um, maybe away from the rest of the administrative staff. And so we don't always um, build the bridges that maybe we should, um, but I think getting to know what everybody does, but also um, learning to kind of collaborate in a way that you know, you, you, even within the own department might find that um, you're bending over backwards for something that, you know, okay, we have to rent this $50,000 Celeste from Saigon and, um, oh, but it only plays two bars. And that's probably not reflected anywhere in the instrumentation report that you're getting. That's a, that's a really um, bad example because that never had anything like that. But just don't be afraid to ask the question as long as you can ask it in a way that uh, doesn't suppose that people are idiots. And that's something I've had to learn. So one other thing I want to kind of go back to Enrico when we were, we were kind of joking around, like, you know, my work stops when you guys go on stage, but uh, man, backstage is a stressful environment. Right. And I, I'm so grateful. My very first internship supervisor at the national symphony 
said, our work in operations is to take care of all the details and communicate them well so that the musicians only have to worry about playing their instrument. Um, so you have to learn real fast that you cannot be anything but a calm, cool presence backstage and unflappable, honestly, even if you're screaming on the inside or crying on the inside, like calm, cool presence backstage. And the other thing I've just recently been thinking about um, because there's, we don't have a lot of concerts, but this conversation has prompted me to think about the ability to, in operations, you're doing a lot of planning, you're doing a lot of speculating, you're doing a lot of forward thinking, but the minute that orchestra service is approaching, you have to be 100% present because you might need to problem solve on your feet. You might need to, oh no, where's that wind player? Oh, they have a flat tire. Oh, and they're on the interstate. Who's going to play principal clarinet? You know, I mean, it's like you can't go around screaming with your hair on fire. You have to just be f fully present in the moment, calm, cool, collected, and problem solve the best you can. Um, the show does have to go on, but you know, remembering like who does what, who can I go to, who needs to know what I know, like all that stuff does come back in the moment. But ultimately, like just trying to get that music making going uh, and not ruffling anybody before they have to go on stage in the process is if you've done all that, that's why I feel it's great satisfaction when Enrico, you finally step on stage because <laughs> it means, okay, the music is going to happen really soon and it's all going to be okay. <laughs> what do you, what else do you want to know? Just raise your hand and call on you. Thank okay. you all so much for doing this. This is really refreshing to hear from so many voices of the field and just your excitement about the work that you do is um, encouraging and exciting to me personally. So thank you, Sonia, and all, all of you that are here. Um, I, I wonder if uh, maybe Jessica and Enrico, you can speak to this, but everybody I'm sure has input, um, is sort of who's, who's at the table when you're, when you're planning a program? How, how does that process work? What information are you bringing to the table? And, and I'm sure that looks different for a lot of orchestras, but would love to hear more about that process. It can be everything from two people um, bringing their ideas together, and that happens frequently. I certainly speak, you know, and catch up with Enrico and Giancarlo regularly about where we are in the process. Um, often here, right now, um, there are a couple different combinations that would be us plus our COO, um, that's our structure. And that person is also certainly involved in overseeing, you know, many areas, and artistic is one of them. Um, and our CEO wants to be knowing what's happening as well, certainly, and definitely has um, a, a lot of careful thought about where he would like to see the orchestra going as well. But we also have a larger group, which is called our programming group. That's um, when pre-COVID times, nine or 10 people that involves the, basically the artistic department and several members from the marketing department and communications team, um, all pretty actively on nearly daily communicating, but you know, a, a couple different meetings a week talking about where we are and evaluating um, what the planning looks like because in addition to all of, you know, obviously the orchestra concerts that we're doing, we also run our own venue and present um, a lot. And that is just a constant cyclical uh, uh, structure in terms of programming and putting up concerts. Um, and so we really look at that in, in a very, um, a democratic way, I would say, um, versus more of the artistic side, which does, you know, somewhere between Moses coming with the plates and collaborating with all 10 of those people, somewhere in between, you know, we want your feedback, but also there are times where we need to do these things and we need to work on how we're going to help you deliver that message. Um, so, so that's a little bit about what it looks like for us here and the different programs we do. I'm wondering if any of the panelists can share if they um, have worked more hands-on with any of that technology and how and how you um, see using technology in your own role going forward. Well, I can speak a little bit. So we were lucky, um, for those of you that don't know, we opened a concert hall in January uh, and it is just the best case scenario to open a concert hall in the middle of a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, we were fortunate because um, a handful of years ago, in a design meeting, we made the choice and we basically said, why are this place like it's Detroit? 
which at the time Detroit, even before Berlin really was doing a ton of digital content. And so um, in the fall, um, I worked with our, we have a staff um, audio and video producer who has a master's degree as a classical recording engineer, um, but he's very skilled in all of these technological aspects. Um, so he and I worked together to develop a system, basically buy all the um, end equipment, um, you know, from cameras to switchers to um, remote camera operators, lenses, you know, just basically all of that stuff. Um, and so that was that was the big piece of it. Um, you know, in terms of the equipment itself, we are hiring a team to come in and do that. And I can't speak a lot about it. Uh, I have spent a little bit of time with him, though, um, learning the basics of how the stuff works because of COVID. You never know when you're going to be down a body. Um, you know, as Sonia mentioned, it could be a flat tire on the freeway, or in this case, it could be, uh, yeah, um, turns out somebody I was next to uh, has COVID, and so now I can't come in and work, And I'll, but you still got to do a concert on Saturday night. So um, I know a little bit about that. I'm by no means an expert. I think... Um, common I would say with everything is uh, find experts, you know, and I, I've worked in a smaller shop before and now in Milwaukee, obviously a bigger team that we can rely on everybody's um, great skills. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, maybe where this goes moving forward. I, I would venture to say that it's not going to go away. The cat's out of the bag. Um, you know, we're talking now about, um, how can we financially make this work um, in the future? We have patrons who are elderly and don't like getting out. Imagine that a symphony with elderly patrons, right? Um, they also go south for the winter. Um, uh, but the one of the biggest challenges is um, it costs as much to do a stream if you have one person paying for it at home as if you have 5,000 people paying for it for, at home. But it'll be interesting to see when we come back what's gonna happen um, and um, what additional compensation is going to be required to the orchestra musicians, um, you know, and, and in tandem with that, um, the rights holders for the music uh, and the guest artists, conductors, um, that's probably going to play the biggest role in all of this, but it's not going to go away. Well, we did it, guys. 70 whole minutes on artistic planning and operations and so excited for um, all of you that came today. I hope this was helpful. I hope you feel like you learned something. Um, I'm thank so grateful to our panelists for taking some time out of your Saturday. Uh, you know, I think the other cool thing about the work we get to do with orchestras is that we're musicians first too, right? And I've seen ways that my oboist self, you know, has informed my work every day of my career. And also the skills I learned as a musician directly translate. I'm, I'm actually realizing more now how I can transpose those skills that I learned as a musician about project management or conflict management, um, all types of things that if you do that work of transposing your, the skills you learn as a musician, you'll find pretty quickly that you can apply them to new situations. So that's meant as an encouragement that you are well equipped to do this work. We all started as musicians and we all got here through, you know, just doing it. Um, so uh, if you feel encouraged, I hope, you, you know, I hope you do and take the next step in your career. And if you need to find out any more information or reach out to any of these, these folks, just uh, do that too. But uh, thanks so much for coming today and stay tuned. We've got some really amazing stuff coming up on Orchestra Careers in this next month. So I'll be sure to loop you all in so you don't miss out.